everyone. Hey, everybody. This is Gatsat's second interview this week while being unbelievably sick. But you know what? The defense of truth doesn't care if you've got a cold or a cough. And so here I am today with the intrepid and courageous journalist Andy No, who is a senior editor at the Post Millennial News and also a New York Times bestselling author. God damn you. Uh, unmasked Inside Antifa's Radical Plan to Destroy Democracy came out in 2021. How are you doing, Andy? I'm very happy to be speaking with you. been looking forward to this. Thank Likewise, so it's been years where we've been saying, hey, when are you coming on and so on? And finally, it's here. Uh, I asked you before, offline and you said I could share. You've now moved from the utopia of Portland, Oregon, where you know everybody sings Kumbaya to London which is greatly enriched by noble adherence of peace. How is that going? So uh, I get asked similar questions all the time, like uh, is which place is worse? And um, the challenges that are posed in both places are, are very different. So Portland or many left-wing urban areas in the US um, have elements of radical leftism where it's dominated in government and education um the uh judicial system is corrupt the prosecutor's office are corrupt in that they turn a blind eye to left-wing political violence so you can have um arson rioting incitement to violence death threats maiming and injuries of people and you see over and over if they're doing it for the leftist political reasons they are not prosecuted or on the rare chance that they are they and actually convicted they're given some type of sweetheart deal no jail time small fine whereas in the uk you don't it, the um criminal justice system is in my view less um corrupt uh compared to the us uh the way it's set up um it's less politicized however um the challenges uh, in Western Europe and in UK uh, um, are, are immense in, in that um, certain uh, immigrant de demographic communities are, are radicalized um, for, for more, more than two, for two generations, I would say. And you have some communities that operate in a separatist way. You have, and, and I, I mean, I'm speaking a bit euphemistically, but I know in your show, we can cut through the BS. I'm talking about Muslim communities. Um, we've seen over and over how um, uh, whenever there's conflict in involving Israel, you, there's a rise in anti-Semitic attacks. There's also many more instances of Islamic terrorism here. And so that that is an immensely uh, deep challenge that they deal with here. It's very different than the other set of challenges that I just talked about in Portland and other places. Although now we're seeing an interesting phenomenon crystallize a bit more, particularly in the U.S., although it's happened more in the, in, in the Europe and the U.K., in that the coalition building between, between the radical left and the Islamists. Yeah, so Jamie Glazoff, are you familiar with him? Do you know who that is? No, please tell me more. Uh, Jamie yeah. Glazoff is, I think, by by training, is a historian. I think he got a PhD in history somewhere in Canada. I can't remember where. I think he now lives in Southern California. He wrote a book a few years ago. I, I, I hope I don't butcher the title. I think it was called United in Hate, where he specifically speaks exactly about the alliance that you just mentioned, the, the alliance between sort of the progressive left and the Islamists. And of course, the progressive left, I think their blind spot is that they think that somehow by uniting and going to bed with the hardcore Islamists, somehow they will be spared when, you know, if the Islamists were to ever take over, it's not as though they love the progressive left, correct? Well, that's correct. But we, I mean, with the radical left, they, they, they never have the interests of their own countrymen at heart. In fact, they hate their fellow citizens. Um, and I mean, we see this just recent, recent days with all these queers for Palestine, trans for Palestine. I mean, these, these people are stupid, but they are also aware clearly of what happens 
to LGBTQ plus people in the Palestinian territories. I'm not only talking about Hamas run Gaza, I'm also talking about the Palestinian Authority run West Bank. Life is horrific for gay people there as well. And in spite of that, or perhaps because of that, one could even argue, they still show up for these demonstrations with these banners with those who really would like to see them killed. Well, I mean, I just had a few days ago, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it. If you haven't, please do. And I'm also imploring my my listeners to and viewers to watch it. I had uh, two days ago a Yemeni uh, who now lives in Sweden uh, activist. So, of course, he was born into a Muslim family, so he understands Islam very well. He speaks Arabic, of course, as I do. And he, he happens to be a gay man. And so, you know, he... Not not surprisingly, he shared what, you know, what would happen to you in Yemen if you were openly gay, if somebody found out and so on. And it's really quite remarkable that it doesn't matter how much evidence you provide to parasitized Western minds. Somehow they know better, right? The, the, per, the person in Portland or in New York walking around with the banners Queers for Palestine knows better about the reality of gay life in the Middle East than, uh, than, than this gentleman. His name is uh, Luai uh, Ahmed. How, is there any way? I mean, yes, I wrote the book called The Parasitic Mind, but I, I, I'm, I'm growing increasingly pessimistic at the possibility of being able to offer people inoculation against these parasitic thoughts. Do, do, are you more hopeful than I am? I'm not. I'm actually very pessimistic. I think uh, for several years now, we see that there is a a consistently ready supply of essential foot, so essentially foot soldiers for leftist causes, P young people, adolescents, youth, many of them who have been radicalized in the public education systems. Um, and we're not talking only about universities anymore. We, we, that, that's a discussion from 10 years ago. Now we're, we're seeing it in the high schools, junior highs, and even primary schools. Um, one troubling trend that's been adopted in the UK very recently, um, just in the last 48 hours, now there are these uh, school strikes for Palestines that are sort of emulating what we've seen happen in the U.S. previously for either BLM or for, for Palestinian causes. Now we have in Muslim areas students skipping class to go out and protest. Um, I just went to one of these um, predominantly Muslim boroughs to observe and to document what's going on. And um, unsurprisingly, as I've written out about before, it it is a parallel society. I'm not just talking about it happening to be uh, a Muslim majority borough. You see a whole different set of different values, obviously different religious practices, but how life is oriented is entirely different. And um, in my view, the I mean, it's a sign of Islamist separatism when you have children, girls, who are all entirely veiled, some of them even not just wearing a hijab, but actually even covering their faces. Um, last week, we saw similar scenes in Brooklyn, New York, uh, of these children, many of them wearing niqabs, uh, shouting um, not just Allahu Akbar, but also other Islamic chants and going around intimidating Jewish-owned businesses in, in Brooklyn. And these type of scenes are, now that it's happening more and more, I'm, I'm concerned that people have just sort of accepted that this is, well, obviously this is life in Europe, but this is relatively new to the US, this type of open Islamist activism in terms of the crowds that we're seeing and the youth that are involved. And we don't really see people talking about it. There's kind of banal statements by some politicians, Democrats who have talked about um, anti-Semitism and all that. But I don't think it's really getting to the like the deeper issue. Yes, there's anti-Semitism in a lot of this, but there's also there's more going on. Yeah, you know, uh, about two, I can't remember if it was about two weeks ago, maybe I put out a tweet that went really, really viral. I, I don't know how many people, 11, 12, 15 million people saw it. It got all kinds of attention. And I, one of the reasons I think it got a lot of attention is because people were surprised by the somber tone that that tweet took 
where usually even when I'm dealing with very serious issues, I can always find a way to be sarcastic or humorous or flippant or jovial. But here it was very dark because it was really reflecting my you know, ever-growing realization that there's a perfect confluence of factors that makes the problem almost intractable. Let me explain and I'll have you weigh in. Uh, you know, if if your physician tells you, God forbid, that, uh, you know, you have stage four cancer and then, you know, here are some intervention strategies that we can try to hopefully beat it. And then your answer is, well, first of all, there is no such thing as cancer. And if there is such a thing as cancer, it's probably the Jews who did it. And probably they have the cure for cancer and they're withholding it because they're trying to make money. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to smoke four packs a day and inhale a bag of asbestos because I want to prove to you that there is no such thing as cancer. That's really what you're seeing in the West, which is, you know, th there are opportunities to correct, to autocorrect now and do things that hopefully will ensure that our grandchildren will have, you know, a, a better society than the one we're currently facing. But there is absolutely no stomach from Western leaders to implement or even discuss some of the strategies that need to be implemented. And of course, I, as you said, this is a no bullshit show the reality is when you let in millions of people who do not share many of whom do not share and when i say many it's not 20 percent don't share you know you've got pew surveys that show that people coming from the middle east have about a 95 to 99 percent expressed jew hatred well then it's not surprising that when the numbers of immigrants coming from those cultures reach a certain tipping point, you're going to have increased Jew hatred. You don't need to be a fancy professor to get that. So is there a way to eventually break through to our policymakers? I mean, I know that in, in Britain, there was a woman who was recently fired as home secretary who was trying to talk about this. And her reward was she was summarily fired. Do we have any hope, Andy? So um, in the U.S., I ask myself, actually, what can be done given sort of the, the legal framework around protections with the uh, free speech in the First Amendment? So some of the inter interventions that have happened, um, I'll, I'll name some countries in Western Europe. So in the U.K., they, um, there's uh, incitement to racial hatred is illegal. And this is the legislation that is being used to arrest a number of suspects that have been arrested at these pro-Palestine, pro-Hamas rallies, and also expressing uh, support or inviting support for um, banned terrorist groups is also a criminal offense here in the UK. So some people have been arrested um, and are facing charges based on that. There's, there's similar legislation that exists in other countries in the EU as well. Um, France banned the pro-Palestine rallies in fear of knowing mm -hmm. that, you know, anti-Semitic incitement of violence would occur. Germany's restricted and banned a number of them as well. So those type of interventions cannot take place uh, legally in the U.S. because of the First Amendment. And so um, I, 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 don't, I don't have a good sort of... Um, I haven't thought of any way, at least within America, that you could really challenge at the legal level some of these issues that we're seeing because fundamentally it is a speech issue. And um, what I've seen some people on the right struggle with for the last few, since the 7th of October is like people who previously have described themselves as very um, free speech absolutists are, are kind of now really struggling with seeing, well, we are having an environment where this type of incitement to terrorism, incitement to hatred is is being allowed and, and, uh, and done with impunity because it can be. So I'll, I'll give my uh, uh, remedy, which I'm not sure if it works within the legal framework of the United States. I am a free speech absolutist. You probably heard me mention in the past that I support the right of Holocaust deniers to deny the Holocaust. It is almost inconceivable to think of something more insulting and offensive than that, right? The wholesale industrial scale level eradication of an entire people that's obviously fully historically documented. Someone can get up and say, well, it didn't happen. And if it did happen, it was only 2000 Jews that were killed, not 6 million. And yet I recognize that in a free society, you have to you have to be able to tolerate the most offensive speech. But on the other hand, and I don't think this violates my commitment to 
free speech absolutism, I think that you could have belief systems that by their very nature are a incitement to violence. In other words, the, the DNA of their content is such that there is you know, I mean, I can literally quote all the passages from those particular belief systems that are direct incitements to violence. So the only way that I can see this being resolved, although I understand that with the uh, the the the, uh, the tradition of having freedom of conscience in the United States, it might be difficult to go after religious beliefs. It might need to be the case that certain religious tenets are viewed as seditious. They are they are they are literally treasonous against the host nation, and that would be the only way that you would be able to deal with it. But I don't see uh, the West in general, and even the United States with this First Amendment protection, ever having the stomach to do that. Um, I think one possible way that um, these ideas could be challenged outside of like a criminal justice system is if civil society was quite um, equipped to recognize this type of extremist language and views and, and to challenge it, such as in America, what they do for like far right neo-Nazi type groups. You have all these so-called hate watch groups. Uh, the media is obviously very good at it. And there's so much um, focus on it, actually. I think what's happened is that um, they've painted a narrative that like the own, the threat to democracy, the threat to uh, everything American freedom and, and minorities and all that is only coming from the right and the far right. And so all these organizations, uh, many of them have a lot of money. I'm talking about like SPLC, ADL and others. They now that w they've been forced to, um, well, hopefully they've been forced to recognize that um, there's all this uh, Jew hatred that's operating on the left and, and among many Muslim Americans. Unfortunately, they don't have the tools yeah. um, to deal with it at all, and neither does the media. And I guess this speaks more broadly to the politicized mind that you, you write about and speak about. Um, the institutions that these people are a part of have, have been captured as well. So it's, I mean, even if they there's no will also to even you know confront uh, these challenges um in their own organizations to just to better inform the public and i think so you know i've, I've long thought about all these issues i've been talking about them for decades it, there is something in the western mind that views it as incredibly gauche to criticize a religion right that's sacrosanct right but of course religions don't come in the same form. An extremist Jainist, right? It's someone who, who practices Jainism is someone who really goes out of their way to not step on ants, right? So if you if you know the practice of Jains, they walk around with a sweep, with a, with a broom, and they sweep the floor as they walk because they don't want to inadvertently step on any living organism. So someone who is a fundamentalist Jainist, who really takes their religion seriously, is really sweeping the street as they walk to not, uh, you know, squash an ant. Now, extremists or fundamentalists of other religions, because they're operating with a different memoplex, a different set of ideas, are going to arrive to different behavioral patterns as a result of their commitment to their religion. But yet the Western mind, because it has been so inculcated with this notion that, you know, the U.S. was founded on religious liberties. So there is no instinctual reflex for the for a Western or American person to say, no, I, I am in the right to criticize these tenets from this particular religion. And I think what allows this to happen is another idea pathogen, cultural relativism, right? Who are you to judge whether other cultures view it okay to cut off the clitorises of five-year-old girls? If you do that, Andy, you are a cultural imperialist. Don't impose your standards on another. So because of these cocktails, it leaves us completely exposed and vulnerable. So I observe um, in, in the US and Canada that actually there's quite a lot of um, hatred of Christianity and insulting of people with Christian beliefs. That's um, for a long time, the, the one religion that people in, in public, politicians included, 
feel comfortable insulting and degrading. And I, and, and I make this observation as somebody who, who's not religious myself, by the way. Um, it, I think, um, I mean, it, I guess I would be less irritated about this if it was sort of a free for all for all religious beliefs, but certain religious beliefs are, um, particularly with Islam, are, are quite are treated as um, sacr sacrosanct and above criticism. Um, I think partially uh, a lot of that's motivated by this relativism that you you just talked about. Some of it's motivated by just left wing ethics and views, and then some of it's motivated by fears as well. Um, there's just there's just been too many terrorist attacks in the West related to people who have been accused of blasphemy. Um, so, yeah, that's. Um, that's re the reality we li uh, we live in. And going back to what we were just talking a moment ago about um, what can be done either through civil society or through governments, you know, I think the the approaches that have been done in in the UK and the EU are really band aid. Um, exactly, it, it, they're small band aids. I mean, okay, you you charge somebody with incitement. Somebody's convicted of incitement to hatred, racial hatred. Um, there's usually a fine, um, and then, I mean, that doesn't really solve like the bigger issues that are happening in some of these communities. Um, uh, and you mentioned Suella Braverman, who was the, um, the head of the, um, the home office in the UK, and that's the equivalent of DHS, uh, in the U S yeah, and she was just fired uh, earlier this week and she was very brave in many of what she her open criticisms of multiculturalism and and she branded these Palestinian marches as hate marches and that was I mean she was absolutely destroyed in the press and by the chartering classes um, and and now David Cameron's brought back in as a in a cabinet office former Prime Minister David Cameron I mean it was under when he was Prime Minister that there were there were all these IS Islamic State attacks and all these British citizens were um, leaving to go to Iraq and Syria and the government was scrambling to find like what let, let's identify what British values are so we can try to make society more cohesive and they defined it as um, tolerance and democracy I mean that's that's not an identity that sorry in my view that's an that's not an identity that Muslims are going to buy into tolerance and diversity in democracy. Yeah. So a couple of points. Number one, regarding your band aid stuff, here's an analogy that I've used to 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 demonstrate the inefficacy of a lot of these bans. You know, let's ban the pro Hamas. Yes, I mean, okay, sure, it's it's a step forward, but the analogy that I would use is your hair is on fire, and rather than putting out your hair being on fire you seek ways to deal with the dandruff in your hair, right? So I'm going to handle the dandruff, but the fact that my hair is literally on fire, that's just secondary. I won't worry about that. So that, so I'm completely on board. But, you know, the, the issue of, uh, you know, trying to inculcate some of these uh, immigrants with, you know, quote, British values, that speaks to a point. I'm actually thinking of writing a, a, an article for one of the, you know, popular outlets on this. So are, are you familiar, Andy? And, and if you're not, that's fine. I'll explain it. Are you familiar with the notion of theory of mind? Do you know what that is? Have you heard no, that? Please explain. Theory of mind is a psychological ability that basically argues that for humans to engage in meaningful dialogue, we're a social species. You and I have to talk to each other, negotiate reality. I have to have theory of mind to be able to have a meaningful conversation with you. Meaning what? I have to put myself in your mind to know what you might be thinking. And you do the same with me. And the ability to have reciprocal theory of mind allows us to typically communicate in a hopefully productive way. One of the things that you do with people that uh, children that you think might be autistic is you actually from a very young age, give them a test to measure if they have theory of mind. So by a certain age, a child should be able to put themselves in the mind of another in solving some task. And autistic children fail theory of mind. Now you might say, well, okay, well, what are you talking about? What does that relate to what we're talking about? So I am proposing that there is a form of 
lack of cultural theory of mind in the West. So rather than me talking about, I may or may not have theory of mind when it comes to interacting with Andy, no, it's do I have cultural theory of mind, meaning can, do I understand, for example, the Middle Eastern mindset to be able to know what are the values that you know incite them to do the things that they do? And do they share my values? And of course, the West doesn't have cultural theory of mind, I argue, precisely for what you said, which is they view that if you're tolerant, if you're magnanimous, if you're infinitely kind, if you're infinitely generous, if you're infinitely welcoming, those values are so virtuous that they will have an impact on the one to whom you're imparting those values. Whereas as someone who comes from the Middle East, I could tell you that what that is communicated to many folks in this region is weakness, 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 weakness to be conquered. And so that's an intractable problem because if you don't understand what are the values that are you know, shaping how the other is interacting with you, you're going to make the same mistakes over and over again. I... <laughs> You know, I, I, I'm I often criticized for being, uh, I guess, harsh in some of my writings against the, some of these migrant communities. Uh, and I think one, one area that I want to illuminate a bit more on is that I have um, sympathy in the fact that, like, it's, many of these, speaking in, in uh, of UK and Europe, some of these immigrants who come, uh, we'll move into a particular area where there are many people from the same home country. And then once they're there, they, um, the organizations that are operating there um, are, are these Islamist groups. And so it's like the, the host country for so long, I think now they're starting to recognize some of the issues. I, I don't know if they're doing much about it, but... Uh, um, they, they weren't aware that these organizations that were propped up um, some of them received government funding or people who had language barriers were directed to these organizations for support um, or explicitly directing them to organizations that do um, preach or, or have re like a religious essence of um, separatism. And so it's it's also a failure of the state in part for for integration. Um, and I mean, this discussion, though, has been going on for how many years now? And do we see anything really changing on the ground? No, you can look at different models. The French um, laicite, right. in, I guess, from an American pr perspective, can be seen as very sort of um, harsh. Uh, uh, you know, the state, has, the state in France has the power to shut down religious institutions. They've shut down a number of mosques. Um, the U.S. doesn't have the power to do that, for example. Uh, Britain is very um, uh, tolerant with its multiculturalism approach to its immigrant communities, and that hasn't produced uh, good integration either. There's, I mean, yeah, you, I mean, there's so many British radicalized Muslims. So it, I mean, in my view, it does seem like regardless of the country you have, um, pretty big issues. Um, some people point to America as being the best example of Muslim integration. Um, in my view, I think it's because the Muslim numbers are quite low. Exactly and... right. <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah. right. It's it it's all okay until it isn't right. Lebanon, where I was born and raised, was all good and you know pluralistic and tolerant until you had to wear running shoes and really run fast. So that your head is not decapitated from the rest of your body. So, so yes, it's it. The United States appears to be a bit, you know, better on that trajectory for the exact reasons that you mentioned. But demography is destiny, and uh, wait till those numbers increase, as we're now seeing, right? I mean, one of the reasons. In Michigan, why, I mean, there's Michigan, there is Minnesota, right? So I I put out a, a one of those kind of Socratic uh, polls that I put up on Twitter where I'm trying to show people so, so i say let's suppose as a hypothetical exercise you know there was an increased number of rashida tlayib and uh, ilhan omar in in uh, in congress would that result in a greater protection of 
you know, American freedoms or lesser. Well, the fact that a single person would actually argue for greater freedoms, it shows that it's bad. But you should just go and watch the numbers that I receive. And now, again, remember, you know, I'm, I probably have an audience that is, you know, more attuned with, you know, the way they should properly be thinking. And yet you get tons of people who say, oh, yeah, more more Ilhan Omar could only benefit the United States. So that's why I, I put out that tweet where I was so pessimistic, because if the individual doesn't, or the individual or the society don't have a self-preservation instinct, then it's all doomed. Um, you know, I've seen a, a lot of uh, extremist uh, protest activity happen at the university that, um, you're you're at and obviously at many many other universities across america and, and canada and when i look at that and then also i see this these activities inv inv happening at high schools and involving children i um i don't know how you de-radicalize these these people it's like it's the problem is here and it's um to me it seems like it's kind of too late to do anything. I agree. So I, I've often said, and now, I mean, I hate to be the guy saying, I told you so, but I get tons of emails from people saying, oh boy, I sh we should have listened to you five years ago, 10 years ago. But I think that when people will wake up, what will end up happening is that there will be a lot more violence than had we solved the problem 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So there will be an awakening. The problem, to your point, is that the awakening when it happens will only take one form. It will have to be violence everywhere. As we're seeing it now with the protests, right? Right now with the protests, you're not seeing orgiastic eradication of people the way you would in Rwanda and Iraq or Lebanon. But believe me, wait another 20, 30, 50 years, and that's what you will have. And I think the problem is that, first of all, people don't have the imagination of being a futurist, like right? they, they can't extrapolate from current trends to where we're going. And also, even if they have the ability, they don't want to do that because that's goddamn scary, right? I, I'm too busy worrying about my daughter's graduation and getting the onions for tonight's dinner. I don't want to be thinking about such existential angst. So it's better for me to bury my head in the sand and hopefully the problem will go away. Okay, so we both acknowledge there are a lot of issues in uh, in all of these countries. Um, what, what what do you think are what do you think can be done? Uh, so my you no, know, I'm I'm glad you, you you brought it back to hopefully actionable solutions. Uh, I think that there are certain belief systems that once they become, never mind in the majority, in a sizable minority, that puts an end to that society. And we've got so much historical evidence of that. So. It, in an abstract sense, although I think I'm being very concrete, it is impossible to coexist amongst certain belief systems. It's as simple as that, right? Karl Popper famously talked about the paradox of tolerance, right? The, it, that, that, you know, in our infinite desire to be liberal and tolerant towards the intolerable, that those intolerable beliefs end up killing you once they are in the majority. So the only way I see this being resolved is if those belief systems are kept at such small numbers that they could never cause harm to the host societies. So you, you can fill in the dots of what that might mean, but there really is no other solution. So to draw an analogy that some people might be offended by, uh, but it is an analogy, the, you know, cancer is dangerous and there is no way to say, but, you know, let's be nice. Cancer cells also have a right to, right? You, If you want to fight cancer, you have to eradicate cancer. There are certain, I, now again, me, most people that belong to these, you know, challenging belief systems are perfectly lovely. And I don't need to preface this and repeat this. But the reality is that those people don't stand up to defend your right to exist as a gay man and my right to exist as a Jewish man when they are in the majority. So then it becomes difficult to decide who's the nice one, who's the radical one, who's going to kill me, who's going to stand by on the sideline and cheer while others are killing me. And I think Sam Harris had mentioned this when he was talking about the concentric circles of 
what constitutes the fundamentalists and the next group and the next group. So the only way I see it is that you have to develop the reflex to not tolerate intolerable belief systems. I mean, does that offer an answer or am I still being too abstract for you? You're being abstract in the sense that to enact what I think you're trying to get at, it would uh, involve draconian chain measures and um, an erosion of, I guess, maybe liberal democratic norms and, and, and precedents. So then what? Okay, so then, so let's suppose we want to adhere to those liberal democratic norms. So Can I bring up an example? Can I bring up a specific please. example? So um, the UK has been dealing with huge numbers of illegal migration uh, for years now. And since um, since Brexit, it's only actually gotten worse with um, migrants coming from uh, uh, Muslim societies in Eastern Europe, um, going through the EU, go going up to France, and then just taking boats. There's these whole smuggling networks. They just come in and as soon as they don't even have, they don't have to land on British soil. They just have to get within British water, and then um, the the military will uh, take them in and escort them in, provide housing, food, and the numbers uh, have been surging for years now. It's been a crisis. It's been a huge pressure point for the Conservative government, who has overseen this issue get worse and worse year after year. Even though they they promise in their platforms and all the speeches that we will. We will stop the boats. They haven't been able to. And Suella Braverman has um, brought up that, well, it's because the the Britain is part of the European Court of Human Rights. So um, they are legally bound to, they one, they have to bring these people in. And then there has to be this whole process of every case has to be heard. Um, obviously, if a asylum claim, because all of them just claim asylum, even though they're coming through from safe countries, and going through a number of safe countries, but they claim asylum, even if it happens to be the case happens to be rejected, they can appeal it. Um, that takes many, many months. And then in the process, they often disappear. And so she's um, she and a number of people have argued that, well, the UK will have to leave the European Court of Human Rights. And that that is just seen as sort of we can't do that. That would be um, violating um, British values, we violating our inter international obligations, et cetera, et cetera. So it's 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 long stopped, and I I I don't know this as a fact, but I assume that pressure point was one of the reasons, probably, why she was forced out because she was willing to actually say, well, this is what we have to do if we want to have the legal authority to actually stop stop these boats and deport these people immediately. But that, but I mean, that again speaks to my analogy of your taking care of the dandruff when your hair is on fire, right? You're trying to, I don't mean you, I mean, let's say in, in case of the, 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 the former home uh, secretary, even though, of course, she's very brave and, and, and her, height, her heart and mind are in the right place, she's trying to operate within, and, and I understand that, you know, we're not a anarchy, you have to operate within certain legal constraints. But in trying to argue, you know, let's walk out of this, let's do this, let's see that the hand, the, the dandruff is okay. Millions of people are coming in, which when they become in the majority, it guarantees that your liberal democratic values that you are so keen on protecting and abiding by as you try to resolve the problem, all of those will be eradicated. So again, that's why Karl Popper's paradox of tolerance is so prescient, right? So so I'm arguing that there has to be a, a, a cataclysmic change in the way you handle it. So, so think about the, the, the savagery of war. Most people want to go about life living you know, without hurting another, without murdering someone. But then once war happens, you end up carpet palming cities, right? Here is Dresden. Bye bye, Dresden. And now we might argue, oh, was that proportional or not? Well, if you want to finish war, you sometimes have to do really, really nasty things so that you could then start afresh and have a peaceful and prosper, uh, prosperous world. So I'm arguing that there needs to be, metaphorically, a carpet bombing of some of these constraints that we have. There is a serious fundamental existential problem, which is for all sorts of reasons, millions of people are coming into 
Western societies whereby they don't share an ounce of any of the foundational values. That needs to stop. We can debate what is the mechanism, but until we realize that that needs to stop, we're going to get nowhere. What do you think of the argument that people point, some people say, well, you're, you're placing too much blame on Muslims when it's, you know, some of the people, many of the people who are going to these um, hate rallies, if you will, in the US or in Canada have been like these white, white leftists, you know, and so and those are, I mean, those people aren't Muslim. And so, and they're totally not just on board with the Palestinian nationalist cause, but many of them have been very explicitly uh, advocating for the actions of Hamas. I mean, that actually has been a little bit shocking to me. We've all known yes. that academics and people in these academic institutions are really radical, but usually I found that they're a bit more subtle in it. Like, you know, like they would talk about, um, uh racial justice and use all these euphemisms but i mean the mass completely came off after 7th of october with some of what they were saying and a lot of them are muslim but many of them are not as well and so you do i mean i guess as part of this coalition building that i was talking about earlier yeah, so, but it so, sorry finish your point no i'm just i'm just bringing up that this is um immigration demographic stuff is part of this discussion um, but I wonder if 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 uh, if we are overstating it, given sort of the salience of this cause um, on the radical white left, if you will. Yeah. So what you're saying is, is something that I would completely uh, subscribe to, which is there isn't a monopoly on, you know, human hearts being dark. So it's not as though I'm arguing as you undoubtedly no, but maybe some of our viewers and listeners don't it's not i'm arguing oh it's only people who come from islamic backgrounds that could have very intolerant views there are jewish people who are assholes and there are christian people who are assholes and there are atheist people who are assholes and so there certainly isn't a monopoly i mean right communism was not started by uh, muslims and nazism was not so so of course there is no monopoly of you know of bad ideas but you can certainly say that stopping the entry of millions of people, I mean, Angela Merkel, uh, I'm, I'm speculating here, but I think it's a pretty accurate psychological analysis of, of her, her motivations. She had an existential grand sense of guilt. My, my grandparents were really, really nasty. They were part of the Nazi generation. I'm speaking as her now. And therefore, when I am chancellor, I'm going to reverse this existential guilt by demonstrating that here in Germany, we do the exact opposite of to what two generations ago we did. We're going to let in all sorts of noble people because we're just going to reverse history and we're going to be kind. And then now, a few years later, people said, oops, maybe it wasn't so good to let in people that don't share some of your foundational values. It's, it really isn't rocket science. But I mean, again, that speaks to why I wrote The Parasitic Mind, because there's nothing more dangerous than a parasitized mind. It's not, it's not the weapons that are dangerous. It's the minds that act on the weapons, right? And so bad ideas, dreadful ideas have consequences. It's certainly the case that it's not only Islamic societies that have bad ideas. The entire history is replete with people who had bad ideas. So I completely concede the point to you. But at least we could start off by saying, let's not worsen the problem by having an open door policy to millions of people. Since you're, you're, you're very familiar with the, uh, the history of the Palestinian nationalist cause, I'm, I'm, I wonder why, um, it, I'm hoping you can illuminate on, on why their propaganda has been so successful on an international scale. I don't think there's really any other like regional conflict that has been able to become, um, you know, driving government decisions around the world. I mean, nobody cared about uh, what what Assad was doing to his civilian population in Syria, where hundreds of thousands of people were killed not that long ago. Um, it's not a big worldwide cause for the Saudi Arabian backed um, airstrikes in Yemen or 
conflicts in the past that happened in Sri Lanka. I mean, I, you can just name all these conflicts around the world in Africa, etc. And nobody cares on, you know, the left, the white left uh, in the US or Canada, or Europe, but on this particular issue, I mean, people are are, are committing like um, acts of vandalism and violence and intimidation against our government because they're like, they're, they're, some of them are like willing to die for this cause. And I, I wonder how did, how did the Palestinian propaganda become so effective? Yeah, I, I, I love your question because I've actually discussed it with some Israelis where I've told them, my goodness, for all of your strengths as, as a military, right, in terms of IDF, in terms of intelligence with Mossad, in terms of uh, all sorts of these physical war manifestations, boy, are you losing the informational warfare. So to your point, so I think it's a couple of factors. I number So there, there are several ways I can answer it. I'll, I'll tackle maybe a few. Uh, part of it is that there is, Def, it, it is definitely a manifestation of Jew hatred, that double standard. So who cares if Saudi Arabia is doing that's just between brothers and cousins. And it does, you know, the old no Jews, no news. So there is an element of that. But I think there's more than that. I think that the what the Palestinians have been able to do is to set up the narrative as one of oppressor and oppressed, and whereby if, if I were to use a singular image that captures a thousand words, it's the 14-year-old intifada boy with the slingshot and the rock facing the big, mean IDF tank. So most people, Andy, as I think you know, are, and I don't say this as an elitist statement, it's just a straight factual statement, most people are breathtakingly idiotic and misinformed, right? So if you just go out into the street and say, oh, you just screamed from the river to the sea, which river, which sea? Can you, you know, I'm going to give you a 20 uh, multiple choice questionnaire on the conflict, they would all get zero. So people are cognitive misers, meaning that they, they are intellectually lazy. They like to use very simplifying heuristics to explain the world. And so when it comes to the Palestinian-Israel conflict, it doesn't matter what the reality is. The Israelis are these nasty Jewish tanks who are indiscriminately engaging in an ongoing genocidal ethnic cleansing of peaceful, noble, kind, slingshot-throwing 14-year-olds. That's the narrative. That's the narrative that is taught in Near East studies at Columbia University and Cornell University. So it's not surprising then that if I am a cognitive miser, meaning I'm an intellectually lazy, I'm an utter imbecile, and I am fed all this brainwashing, then their narrative is going to win, and they are winning. What do you think of this explanation? Well, I I sometimes wonder if um, accusations of anti-Semitism are being recklessly overused in recent weeks. Um, in the same way that we, um, you know, how often, and I'm not I'm not saying that this is necessarily what's happened here, but for example. Um, there are Muslim activists and Muslim radicals who, anytime you talk about some type of Islamic terrorist attack that's happened, you you report. I report on the religious aspect of a suspect in a terrorist incident. Then that first accusation is Islamophobia. I've seen some people saying that accusations of anti-Semitism are being used to shut down discussions, um, and also in, par in part of this, what we've seen as well is all these Jewish American groups and Jewish Canadian groups on the left. Who have led some of these protests and you know they're basically saying not in our name and you know they get a lot of media attention they've done things in dc and and many other places and you know they're trying to say it's not you know this cause is not anti-semitic at all and i yeah i'm curious what you think of like those various arguments that are that are out there yeah uh well i appreciate you asking me questions because i you know i often tell my guests please it's not an interview so so thank you for just having a, a conversation rather than just a one-way me asking you questions i appreciate that uh i i do agree that it, it is wrong to to argue that any criticism of 
say Israel or any policies of Israel constitutes anti-Semitism. I don't I don't buy that, right? And 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 to your point, there are of course many committed committed in the sense of uh, Jews who identify very much with their Jewish identity who are at the forefront of criticizing certain uh, policies and certain military actions that the Israeli government's done. So so I'm 100% willing to concede that point. Uh, but I do think that what we've seen subsequent to October 7th is to your earlier point where you mentioned that you were surprised by how much open anti-Semitism you're seeing. I think that has really served as a catalyst of you know kind of opening people's right you just scratch the surface and you see this unbelievable jew vitriol coming out and and this is not be, you know i don't levy the accusation you're a jew hater just because you criticize israel never but here here's an example of jew hatred you ready and and this is going to be relevant since you're living now in england if i share the very clear demographic reality of the folks who have been engaging in industrial scale level gang rapes of young British white girls up and down of Britain in every single city that you could think of. And they all have one thing in common. They all have as part of their name, the word Muhammad. And then I get a thousand people who write to me and say, yeah, you know who's to blame for all those rapes? You ready, Andy? It's the Jews. You know why? Because it was Jewish philosophy that promulgated the idea that we should have open border policies. So when Muhammad raped your 12-year-old daughter, it was Mordechai who is really to blame. So that is Jew hatred. I mean, it's as a matter of fact, it's a form of diabolical Jew hatred. So I completely concede your point. Not every criticism of some Jewish cause or some Israeli policy constitutes anti-Semitism. But I think what we've seen since October 7, in many cases, it's your garden variety Hitler type of Jew hatred. How, how do you think people can better recognize when there is actually anti-Semitism operating in some ideas where it may be perhaps perhaps there's a, um, a get out argument. Um, I mean, you know, some of the people who um, express a strong hatred of Soros, I think, are motivated by anti-Semitism. They will bring up the fact that he's Jew all the time. And then there are many, I would say most, who bring up actually the criticisms of him is how he's used his money to support and fund organizations that have been really destabilizing to a number of countries. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm just- so I can know, answer that for you. I can answer that for you. So it, let's suppose, so Epstein, the, the pedophile was Jewish, yes? That is not a manifestation that Jew, that he did what he did because of his Judaism, right? He didn't he didn't invoke a particular passage in in Deuteronomy or in Genesis or in in a particular Talmudic scripture and say, oh, this is why I have Epstein Island. It's because I'm allowed. So the fact that he was Jewish is completely irrelevant to him being a diabolical pedophile. On the other hand, if if somebody does something in the name of their religion and justifies it in the name of their religion, then you ascribe it to exactly what he's telling you, right? So, mm -hmm. so for example, when you say, not you, but the, the Jew haters that write to me, when you say, oh, well, the economy is tanking, and then they list the following people who are, who happen to be Jewish and who serve in the in the treasury department that is Jew hatred because they're not it's not because they are Jews and they're using Jewish scripture scriptures that they that the government printed more money resulting in inflation to go up right you see what i'm saying so the so whenever so that's why by the way i sarcastically created the game 6 degrees of jew which is a game that I was very familiar with in Lebanon, where every single calamity is blamed on the Jew. Your wife cheated on you? Well, it's because she consumed pornography that put this, she, that made her libidinous. And it's the Jews who control the pornographic uh, industry. So I think that's how you can gauge whether an argument is in good faith or not.
Jews do a lot of horrible things, but they do it not because they're Jewish, despite the fact that they're Jewish. And, and some Muslim, when a Muslim goes into a bank to rob the bank because he just wants to support his crystal meth, I don't care that he's called Muhammad. But if he if he if he flies a plane into a building and then quotes the Quranic verse that justifies that he should do it, it is because he is Muhammad. I mean, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I mean, playing devil's advocate, couldn't one argue that um, the 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 rape gangs involving Pakistani pe people of Pakistani background in in the UK that they they weren't not they weren't doing it for on a religious mandate. They were men who were involved in organized crime, and the fact that it's being brought up all the time that they're Muslim is Islamophobic. What do you think of that argument? Well, I mean, I would totally agree that that were the case if I weren't aware that many of them have openly stated that, you know, uh, non-Muslim meat, as they say, uncovered meat is openly uh, open for grabs. So again, it, I, I'm not right. There might be Albanian gangs who are Muslim. They're organized gangs, right? They are not in it right they, they engage in extortion and money laundering and... they've been doing the the smuggling of the people into britain by the by the boats by the way oh, there there you go now in that case the driving motive is profiteering I, I, i'm they are russian organized gangs they are israeli organized gangs they are italian organized gangs so all of those groups are doing what they're doing because they are motivated by greed, they want to make money, right? And, and organized crime becomes the conduit by which I make money. On the other hand, if I say, I am bringing in loads of people from Islamic countries because the principle of hijra, hijra is the Arabic word of immigration, we're going to conquer the miserable, as the Muslim Brotherhood said, well, then you're doing it because of your religion. So again, a thinking person is able to be honest and say this is caused by your religion this had nothing to do with your religion regrettably the western mindset says it doesn't matter how much evidence you show me that it is because of your religion i'm never going to accept it that's why by the way in chapter six of the parasitic mind the chapter that i titled ostrich parasitic syndrome i describe how the now it's 44,000 plus terror attacks since 9-11 alone in nearly 70 countries, all of which the, the terrorists will say, we're doing it because of our religion. They'll quote the scriptures why they're doing it. Then what does the West say? Let me just share a few of them with you. It's because of beard bullying, right? The San Bernardino guy, it's because he was bullied for his beard. It, in France and in Belgium, it's because of lack of art exposure. I mean, which of us didn't decide to go join ISIS in Raqqa to throw those pesky gays off rooftops because we weren't exposed to enough Picasso? So again, it comes from a reflex of, I never want to ascribe sinister actions to a religion. That's simply too gauche. And until we're able to recognize that most Muslims are perfectly lovely people, but some Muslims take their religion very seriously and will act on it, we're only going to get to a darker place. So I've been on the ground now for almost six weeks covering these demonstrations that have happened um, in the UK. And one thing I've, I've witnessed is that pretty much uh, almost all of them, you'll the people will do uh, shut down streets and then they'll do prayers, Islamic prayers on the streets and in public areas and parks or, or in the middle of the road. Um, they'll blast out Islamic um, uh, sound, uh, not like prayers, prayers. over loud, loudspeakers. Um, and then many <coughs> of them will do the Allahu Akbar chant. So is it is it right to view these actions as um, provocative or are these are they just meant to be acts of peaceful religiosity that is happening out of protest? 100% the former, not 100%, 1 million percent the former, right? When, when you are below a certain percentage, you don't do that. Once you become over a certain percentage, you, you, there are even Arabic words that describe that kind of behavior, right? So 
it, it is a an act of we are here get used to it right look there are i mean i mean this is literally true there are well over 10,000 documented religions now some religions for example christianity you could break it up into many many different sects seventh day adventist and lutheran and protestant so let's call each of these a different religion right shia versus sunni versus Ahmadi, let's call them those different sects of Islam. So they're different. There are more than 10,000 documented religions. Why is it only one that does it so publicly, right? Because it is part of the DNA of the religion to say that once we become past a certain number, you will abide by, I mean, there are 57 countries that are, well, 56 plus the Palestinian territories that are part of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, right? Which is an umbrella group for the Ummah. The Ummah is the Islamic nation. Well, each of those countries, Andy, at one point in history had zero Muslims. And then by various mechanisms, many of those countries became 100% Islamic. How did that happen? Was it by magic? Was it that they simply passed around sweets and peaceful Socratic method? No. And so when you affirm your presence by shutting down streets, it's a power play. Now, again, many Muslims will tell you, we don't like that. We don't want that to happen. We're against that. We want to live by Western freedoms. But to, to answer your question, it's absolutely unequivocally a power play. You will accept it. You will shut your mouth and get used to it. Some some scenes that I recorded and I witnessed were quite um, they were a bit surreal in the sense like when when there was a large crowd, angry protesters outside Westminster Abbey, which is centuries old. Monarchs are are buried there. You know, coronations happen there. There's you know, it's one of the most important historical sites for British history and identity. But this group went in front of it and um, they were doing, they were chanting the Islamic faith creed. The la, I, I can't say it, but you know, um, you know, I, I know it. But if I say it, then I'm then I'm officially a Muslim. So I better not say it. <laughs> and so in this religious aspect of these pro-Palestine demonstrations, as they are called, has been kind of completely ignored by the mainstream press locally. I read. I mean, I read what the BBC and ITV and others report on it, and they generally just say these are these are peaceful protests of people arguing for a ceasefire or something like that. And um, I just my observation is that with some of the people there, many um, they are viewing this war, uh, Israel war with Hamas, in a uh, as a um, as a religious conflict. And the type of language that they're using at some of these protests, I think some of the most extreme one I, I went to was one organized by Hizbit Tahrir, which is an Islamist group. They had thousands of people come. This group is banned in, I think, all the Arab countries because of, I mean, their 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 goals are revolutionary to establish a, a caliphate. But they, they operate legally uh, in the UK. And they had up these banners saying Muslim armies, um, they had speakers who were calling for jihad, that was their word, um, trying to mobilize Muslims um, to fight the Zionist army. Uh, those were the type of language they used. And um, it had like no coverage uh, in the establishment press. I was one of the few journalists there to witness this and record. And it's, um, it's, it's, it's surreal in the way that like how banal it is, like it's happening in central London. And if you're a block away at some luxury cafe or luxury designer store, you wouldn't even know it's happening. And therefore it's so much easier to, to deny. Yeah, exactly. Well, I wanted to actually ask you, uh, you were kind enough to ask me several questions. Let me go back to asking you questions. What explains Andy knows bravery? And the reason why I asked, I mean, it sounds as though I'm just complimenting you frivolously. But I, I, that's not my point is because I want to see if there is a way to bottle courage, right? I mean, metaphorically speaking, because you, I mean, you really are one of the, the few. I mean, earlier when I introduced you, I said intrepid. I mean, that's that really is a, a perfect description of you are, right? I mean, you're walking amongst whatever the proud boys, you're walking amongst the crazy Antifa guys, you were attacked famously and, you know, and so on. And so 
there, there seems to be a, to use a term that has been now become associated with me, right? When I say activate your inner honey badger, that's not a call that you need to hear from me because you already came into the world, I guess, equipped with all of the honey badger attitude that one could have. Is that something that you've always had? Is that something that you've developed? Uh, what's the secret of Andy Noe's honey badger attitude? Well, thank you for those kind words. I that's very that's very nice of you to say. I um I actually and you know I don't I often don't view myself as brave because I remember the, these times that I've been really actually terrified. Uh, returning to the streets to document given the attacks I suffered. And I do have a lot of fear, actually. And um, But sorry, before you go on, I'm going to interrupt you. The fact that you have fear and you return mm -hmm. actually speaks to you being a honey badger. Well, thank you. Um, I, For me, it was simply motivated by I don't the fact that I don't see the public getting a full or accurate picture of the nature of these various protests. And you outlined the number of things that are covered. Most people are familiar with my work covering the far, violent far left in the US, particularly Antifa. And I thought, look, my, my words in essays and writings are not going to be as convincing as people seeing the videos themselves of the violence and the extremist statements and chants uh, and slogans that are being used at these violent and extremist rallies and protests. And I, I just went out and recorded and took photos. And for a long, for a while, I was able to do that and just sort of blend in. Nobody knew who I was, so they didn't view me as a threat. But once people started paying attention to my journalism and I was getting published in bigger places, that was when Antifa started to silence me. So, um, yeah, I think, um, I guess one thing um, I was forced to learn and it has helped me become a bit more resilient is that um, when you go against the grain, a lot of people are going to uh, really going to hate you and some violently hate you and the world may hate you and you have to kind of be at peace at that, you know, it it can be a bit distressing to me when when you Google my name and you see that I'm described as a far right provocateur far right extremists, you read what's on my Wikipedia and you come out with, you know, a person that I don't recognize as me and my friends don't recognize as me. And that that is hard, but that's that's the price you pay when you you speak out in a way that's inconvenient for the majority. And so I think coming, you know, for people to to develop a sense of bravery, they have to to be at peace with that. I mean, if you are if you're just reaffirming everything that the New York Times and Washington Post says, you then then you'll get the accolade accolades, and it's not really actually brave to go out and write the type of stuff that we see in the establishment media on these controversial subjects and topics. With that said, you know I I try really hard for my my video work to present it in a way that is <laughs> is neutral. You know, obviously I know there's implicit bias. I'm using the language of the left. It's there. It's in all of us. But I try really to tell people, okay, this is the context when and where, and that's it. And it, it is surprising that the videos that I've recorded is seen as as a huge pr provocation and threat to whatever narrative people have. Um, to the point that some of them are are willing to try to kill me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what I mean, I'm now we're sort of coming. Of course, I could talk to you for hours, but we're coming to uh, the end of our chat. Uh, hopefully, I'll have you again, and it won't take years to to bring you back. Uh, what are some, so? My last book was on happiness. And so in in the in 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 writing that book, I I discussed you know the two most important decisions that you could make that either impart great happiness or great misery upon you is choosing the right partner, the right spouse, and choosing the right profession. And when I talk about choosing the right profession, you know, I discuss things like things that allow you to instantiate your creative impulse. You know, you could be a chef or a stand-up comic or a author or a journalist or uh, an architect. These are all very different professions, but what they share in common is that they all create something that didn't exist until they came along and they created that that plate, that bridge, that book. So in your case, is that what gives you purpose and meaning? You, you want to document things that are out there and add to the conversation? Are there other things that make you happy? What, what are the secrets to why Andy No is hopefully a happy person? 
Um, you know, I'll be honest here. Uh, there, there were times in the past where I, life felt dark for me. I think particularly after the second time I was beaten by Antifa in 2021, I had left Portland for a number of months. I went back and I was undercover and I was exposed and beaten quite severely. There's video of me being attacked on the streets and I run into a hotel for, for refuge. And after that, I really, I, I could, you know, that was when I, I, I was forced to accept the reality that I, I could no longer do this type of undercover type of reporting on Portland, uh, which is my home city, it's where my, my family's based. And, um, you know, faced with that reality and having to, to develop different and new skills of reporting and getting information out was quite hard and at times very lonely because I, I also had to relocate for, for safety reasons away from Portland. So I was away from my loved ones, I still am. And, and that's hard. What keeps me going is then, I think um, I've been fortunate that I'm sometimes in situations like conferences or events or something where people who are familiar with my work come up and, and get a chance to speak with me and they let me know how impactful my work has been, how it's really helped inform them on a number of issues. And those type of personal testimonies face to face when I'm holding their hand or shaking their hand is really powerful and encouraging because sometimes it, it can be, it can feel really lonely when you have all these hit pieces out about you and, you know, with how social media works, people can organize online mobs to try to swarm you and just send you hate and threats nonstop and it's easy for one to sort of center and, and put a lot of weight on that type of hate and forget about, you know, these other statements of encouragement. So for me, it's about um, trying to center gratitude. You know, I'm, I'm really thankful that I, I have opportunities like this to speak with you, um, that, the, you know, there, there are other good journalists out there who, for whatever reason, you know, they, they, their work just doesn't go big and then they stop. You know, I'm really fortunate that there's been people who's who read my work, watch my content and give me a chance and invite me on their platforms. And I'm really thankful for that. I don't take any of it for granted. Well, that, that's beautifully said. I do have a section in the book on the importance of existential gratitude, which you just expressed. So thank you for that. What are some projects? Last question. What are some projects that you might be currently working on that you might want to use this platform to promote? So um, my website is www.andy-ngo.com. One thing that I'm really keen to keep track of is how these Palestine protests uh, grow and how they are, what's actually happening on the ground at some of them. Uh, I, this is a moment in time that I think it, it really has to be documented because if, if you just rely on sort of the record from establishment media, that is only a fraction of the story. And so that is my current project. So you can, if you go on my Twitter at Mr. A-N-D-Y-N-G-O, you can see the, the video coverage from what's been happening week to week uh, in the London area. You know, one of the world capitals, you can see, um, the extremism that's taking place week after week, that's unfortunately becoming a banality. Wow. Well, uh, any books uh, that you might be thinking of writing next to follow up on your New York Times bestselling book? Um, that Yes, but uh, I'm not able to discuss that stuff yet at this time. Ah, very good. Okay. Well, when you, when that one comes out, we'll have you back. Andy, what an incredible pleasure to have you. I think if there's a way to clone you, so that we could spread more courage and intrepid journalism out there. Uh, the world would be a better place. Absolute pleasure having you. Thank you so much. Come back soon. Uh, stay on the line so we could say goodbye offline. Real pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you.